Early this offseason, Mike Elias finally made a trade that sent a prospect to one team and got a major league impact player back to the Orioles. And that somewhat signified, at least for the O's brass, the end of this rebuild, at least that phase of it. But because he made a trade like that, I wanted to go back and take a look at all of the trades that Mike Elias has made as Orioles GM. And today... I will rank the 17 trades Elias has made since coming over to the Orioles. That's coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Monday, March 6th, 2023. And welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, I'm going to be ranking the 17 trades that Mike Elias has made as Orioles GM. Now, technically, he's made more than 17 trades, but I'm only going to be ranking trades that involve a player for a player or at least one player on each side. And, you know, this isn't going to be any trades where it's like a guy is DFA'd and then traded for cash considerations. We're talking player for player, and there has to be a major league player involved on at least one side of the trade, meaning the Mikey Stremski trade will not be on this list. But we'll go number 17 up to number one, how Mike Elias has done on some of these trades, looking back at where some of those players are now that were dealt to the Orioles in those deals. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast. But first, did just want to thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. We're free and available on all podcast listening platforms. And make sure you check us out on YouTube as well. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked on Orioles YouTube channel. And I will let you know, for those who have recently subscribed on YouTube and entered to win the Birdland Hawaiian shirt, don't worry. Stay tuned to the end of this episode. And I will be announcing the winner of the Orioles Hawaiian shirt for our giveaway from last week. So again, stick around to the end of the pod for the winner there. But we thank you all who have subscribed, who are still following along and making Locked on Orioles your first listen of the day. But let's jump right in here. You know, we are looking at 24 days until opening day here, a little over three weeks To the Orioles season gets started and the Orioles are continuing to play spring training games as they did over the weekend. But as we know, none of them are being televised. Today is the day. It's the first mass and televised spring training game of the year. So there's other things to look back on here as well during spring training. I wanted to take a look at trades because I got a good mailbag question last week on a mailbag episode of the pod of what is the best and worst Mike Elias trade so far. And it got me thinking, well, I answered best and worst, but let me go back and look through all of them and see how they all line up, at least to this point. So I decided to rank them 17-1, to the best trades Mike Elias has made since taking over as Orioles GM in November of 2018. Now, as I did mention, there is a little bit of criteria. Number one is, I didn't include any trades that were just like a player was DFA'd or a player was traded for cash considerations. There has to be at least one player on each side of the deal for it to be considered. And then the other stipulation took, took a couple of trades out of here as well. There has to be a major league player on at least one side of the deal. So the Mike Yastrzemski for Tyler Herb deal does not count. Both guys were in AAA when the deal was made. There's a couple of minor league swaps that Elias has made. Those don't count. There wasn't a major leaguer on either side of the deal. So there's 17 trades Elias has made that fit these qualifications. So let's jump right into it. Start with number 17. This is what I believe is the worst trade Mike Elias has made since becoming Orioles GM. And this is the one I mentioned on the mailbag episode last week, but it is the Miguel Castro trade. On August 31st of 2020, the trade deadline day of the shortened 2020 season, the Orioles sent right-handed pitcher Miguel Castro to the New York Mets for left-handed pitching prospect Kevin Smith and teenage shortstop prospect Victor Gonzalez. Now, at the time, it looked like an okay trade. Castro did have two and a half years of team control left, but the Orioles were still in the middle of tanking. They were trying to trade relievers who were going for a pretty high value. And while Gonzalez was kind of a lottery pick who was, you know, 18 years old at the time, Kevin Smith was the reigning New York Mets minor league pitcher of the year. He had just carved up double A in the Mets system. And it looked like a pretty good deal. He was in the alternate site with New York and and came over to Baltimore. It looked like a future 
starting pitcher. Now, Miguel Castro has not since been the pitcher he was with the O's. He's still been good. You know, he, he's pitched for the Mets, pitched for the Yankees. However, on the flip side of that, this part of the trade has been a disaster. Victor Gonzalez, the younger guy, he's still 20 years old. He's still in the system, but he played just 36 plate appearances in the FCL last year and hit just 120. I believe he's still in the system, and he's only 20, but has some strides to make. And then Kevin Smith is also still in the system. The Orioles actually added him to the 40-man roster after the 2021 season, but he still hasn't gotten to the big leagues because his 2022 was bad. His 2021 was kind of a disaster. Last year, Smith dealt with some injuries again, but had a 4.66 ERA in 48 and a third innings in AAA. Did have a 20% strikeout rate, but a 15% walk rate is almost double the league average. His command is just lost him. I mean, people think he might have had the yips at some point here. It's just been bad for Kevin Smith. The O's still have him around. They think there might still be something there, but it has not gone well in that trade. The second worst trade, number 16, I have on the list is the Alex Cobb trade. February 2nd of 2021, the Orioles make a one-for-one -one trade, sending the starting pitcher Alex Cobb to the Angels for Jemai Jones. Now, at this point, Cobb was coming off some injury-riddled years with the Orioles, and it was time to move on. I think everyone agreed it was time for the Orioles to trade Cobb at that point before the 2021 season started. But Jemai Jones was somewhat of a lottery ticket because he had had some good numbers in the minors at times. He'd had some tough numbers. He'd gone through a couple swing changes, a, a big time athlete who could play the infield and the outfield and, and did show some pop, but you just weren't sure what you were going to get out of Jemai Jones. You had the whole situation in 2021 where Orioles fans were just calling for him to get to the bigs. It finally happened late in the year, but he didn't play much. And then, I mean, you saw him a little bit after that, but, Generally wasn't much. He suffers a serious injury. The Orioles end up releasing him. He signs a minor league deal with the Dodgers and looks to be fully healthy uh, in 2023 here in the minor leagues with Los Angeles. He'll probably be in AAA and we could see him in the majors, but he basically didn't give the Orioles anything. And they traded away a legitimate big league starting pitcher. And Cobb is still an impact guy in starting rotations right now. And the O's gave that up for basically what amounted to be nothing in, in Jemai Jones. Trade number 15 on this list, the Richard Blyer deal, August 1st of 2020, just a couple of days into the shortened 2020 season starting. The Orioles deal the left-handed reliever Richard Blyer to the Miami Marlins for Isaac DeLeon. DeLeon, a 21-year-old, could play a little infield, play a little outfield. He actually hasn't been bad. He had 400 plate appearances in Delmarva last year at 21 years old, had a 113 WRC+. plus. Then he went up to Aberdeen at the end of the year and really, really struggled. But we will see him with the Ironbirds to start this season. He is still in the system. But the reason I didn't like the trade is because Richard Blyer had a lot of team control left. He was a really solid lefty who got outs for the Orioles. And you know they traded him when they were in full rebuild mode. But Blyer theoretically could still be in the Orioles' bullpen. And they could use another good lefty. And they gave him up for kind of a lottery ticket prospect who is still in the system and performing somewhat well. But it seemed a little early to give up on Richard Blyer the, the time the Orioles did. And he is now with the Boston Red Sox after being traded for Miami this offseason. The O's are going to see him a lot in division play. Next up after this one, I wouldn't consider this 14th ranked trade bad. It just was basically nothing. April 24th of 2019, the Orioles trade Mike Wright, the right-handed pitcher to the Seattle Mariners, for a shortstop prospect named Ryan Ogren. Ogren eventually converted to catcher while in the Orioles system, but I believe uh, retired sometime after 2021. He was not in the system in 2022. And Mike Wright was then pitching in the KBO shortly after. It was basically a nothing trade. That's why it's at number 14 here. Another trade that was kind of a nothing deal, number 13 on the list, July 29th of 2020, just as the 2020 season was beginning, the Orioles traded Hector Velasquez, a right-handed reliever who never pitched for them but had pitched uh, in the big leagues with the Red Sox before. They traded him to the Houston Astros for right-handed pitching prospect Miguel Padilla, who at the time was just 18 years old. Padilla in his age 20 season in Delmarva last year had a 4.63 ERA in 23 and a third innings. I believe Padilla is still in the Orioles system, most likely going back to the Shorebirds this year. But again, just kind of a, a nothing uh, on other sides trade. You can look at that one. Speaking of trades who haven't really done much for either side, we go to number 12 on this list, the Andrew Kashner trade, the one 
that sealed the deal. As online Orioles fans know, it was July 13th of 2019. The Orioles traded Andrew Kashner to the Boston Red Sox for two teenage prospects in the Dominican Summer League in Elio Prado and Noah Bert Romero. Kashner went to Boston. They started him a little bit. They moved him to the bullpen. He was okay there, but he is out of baseball at this point. Prado and Romero are now both 21 years old, and both were playing for the Delmarva Shorebirds last year. Prado had a 79 WRC+, plus, uh, struggled with some injuries. Romero played the whole year, but just had a 77 WRC+, plus in Delmarva last year. There's a good chance both of them start the year back with the Shorebirds. I don't see either of these guys really getting to the big leagues at any point. They were both lottery tickets for an expiring guy in Andrew Kashner. Just kind of a eh trade uh, that the Orioles made there. Then to number 11 on the list, December 2nd of 2019. A puzzling one at time, or at that time, I would say, for Orioles fans. After Jonathan VR was arguably the Orioles' best player in that disastrous 2019 season, the O's trade VR to the Miami Marlins for left-handed pitching prospect Easton Lucas. Now, Lucas is still in the system. He had a 4.76 ERA in 57 innings in AA Bowie in 2022. Did have an impressive 27% strikeout rate to a 10% walk rate. We're going to see Lucas in AAA Norfolk this year, probably as a reliever, but maybe somewhat as a starter. There's word that he's up to 95, 96 from the left side with his fastball. So I'd say Easton Lucas, I still think, has a chance to get to the big leagues with the Orioles potentially this year. But the trade was odd at the time because of how well VR played in 2019 for the Orioles. Hit for the cycle that year, was in the lineup every single day. But we did learn or or have learned since then VR was not the most well-liked person in that Orioles clubhouse. He has not been very good for the other teams he's played for since then. And so the trade makes a little more sense. And if Easton Lucas does get to the big leagues, it could maybe jump a little further up this list but that is numbers 11 through 17 on this trade list we still got to get to the top 10 coming up next we'll go from number 10 to number six coming up we'll talk about some recent trades coming up on this list as well but first this episode of the locked on orioles podcast is brought to you by built bar if you're looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and calories then you gotta try a built bar we just got through the holidays and for some people the goal is to eat a little healthier for their new year's resolutions well built bar it's perfect for your new year's resolution because it's healthy and it's actually tasty all these protein bars covered in 100 real chocolate they come in unbelievable flavors like churro and peanut butter brownie And I don't know how Built does it, but they still get 17 grams of protein in every bar, still only 130 calories, and still only 4 grams of sugar. And now, you can still go to Built.com, order a box of Built bars, and wait for them to get dropped off at your door. But you can also walk into Walmart, you can walk into Sam's Club, and you can walk out for the first time with a box of Built Bars right then and there. So head to your local Walmart or Sam's Club or go to Built.com to get your hands on those delicious and nutritious Built Bars. So we are ranking the 17 trades that Mike Elias has made since taking over as Orioles GM in November of 2018. We've gone through numbers 17 through 11 here on the list so far. Now it's time to get into the top 10. And at number 10 on this list, we go to another somewhat minor trade. It was July 30th of 2021. The Orioles sent Freddie Galvis back to the Philadelphia Phillies in return for right-handed pitcher Tyler Birch. Now, this trade and the Jonathan VR trade I just mentioned are kind of in tandem because it's sending a shortstop who certainly wasn't your shortstop of the future for kind of a minor league relief type lottery ticket somewhat, and that you think he might turn into a major league reliever. Tyler Birch had a 5.40 ERA in 45 innings at double A last year, 22% strikeout rate, 8% walk rate are both basically league average. He's basically fine. I don't think he's getting to the big leagues. It's just that Freddie Galvis wasn't nearly as good as Jonathan VR was for the Orioles. And Galvis was also an expiring contract. So that's why I would say that trade, maybe not as bad as VR. You could flip these to 10 or 11 really either way here. Number nine on the list, we go to another 2020 trade. August 30th is 2020. The Orioles trade Tommy Malone, who was their opening day starter that year, over to the Atlanta Braves in exchange for two infielders, Greg Cullen and A.J. Graffinino. 
Malone was not good down the stretch for the Braves, and then he got injured and missed the rest of the year after. He was surprisingly good for the Orioles, pitching on a minor league deal. He's bounced around since then, has pitched a little bit in the big leagues over the past couple of years, but has not been very good. For Cullen and Graffinino, Graffinino was released last season, was struggling to kind of stay afloat in the Orioles system. Although Greg Cullen is still here, and he's kind of an interesting prospect. He split the year between AA and AAA last year. Cullen mostly a, a second baseman at this point who can play some third, play a little outfield or first base if you need him to. He had a 126 WRC plus in AA. Then he had a 140 WRC plus in AAA last season, and he is still here with the Orioles. Most think he's... Probably going to start the year back in AAA Norfolk as kind of the utility infielder backup guy behind the, you know, Westberg and Ortiz and Norby combination that the Tides will most likely start with. But he's clearly behind all those guys in terms of infield prospects, but he's still there and he's still putting up good numbers. So Cullen really has an interesting track here. I could see him maybe being traded in a more minor deal with the Orioles just needing to clear space, but a team potentially thinking he could get to the big leagues and wanting him on their team. Trade number eight is the second to last trade, or not the second to last trade, but one of the most recent trades we've seen the Orioles make. It is the Trey Mancini deal. On August 1st of 2022, much to the chagrin of myself and many Orioles fans, the O's traded team and, and city hero Trey Mancini to the Houston Astros in a three-team deal that also involved the Tampa Bay Rays. Chase McDermott, the right-hander, came over from the Astros, and Seth Johnson, the right-handed pitcher, came over from the Rays. A couple days after the trade, Johnson, who was the much higher-rated prospect, did get Tommy John surgery, and most think he will probably miss the entirety of the 2023 minor league season because of that, so of course has not thrown a pitch for the Orioles, but is a consensus top 20 Orioles prospect and was a top 10 Rays prospect at some places at the time of the trade for McDermott, he came over, went to double a buoy, had a 6.08 ERA in 26 innings with the Bay Sox, but he did have a 31% strikeout rate, which is really good. 13% walk rate. Not that good. McDermott probably projects as a reliever long-term. He's got really, really good stuff. Strikeout stuff. Just got to rein in the command. Johnson looks to be the much better pitcher, but we just don't know because he got Tommy John surgery two days after he was acquired by the Orioles. And of course, Trey Mancini, yeah, he was an expiring contract, but uh, would have been nice to see him finish out the year in an Orioles uniform as the O's pushed for the playoffs. Trade number seven on this list, ranked seventh. I've got uh, the one that happened about a week before opening day of 2022, April 3rd of 2022. The Orioles sent two relievers, Cole Salser and Tanner Scott, to the Miami Marlins for two players and a draft pick as well. They got left-handed pitcher Antonio Velez. They got outfielder Kevin Guerrero. And they ended up with a draft pick that the Orioles then selected Judd Fabian with. And of course, Fabian had a great finish to the year in the minors for the O's last year. In terms of Velez and Guerrero, Velez had a really tough time after coming over to Baltimore. He pitched just 48 innings in double-A last year and pitched only about 65 innings in total, had a couple different injuries, was out for an extended amount of time, and had a 6.14 double-A ERA when the left-hander was on the mound. I want to see a fully healthy season from Velez, so hopefully we get that in 2023, but I was not sold from what I saw in 2022 then there's Kevin Guerrero who you know you still don't know what he's going to be he's only 18 years old but he did get 140 plate appearances in the FCL last year and hit only 145 now he did have a 21 percent walk rate which is like crazy high for a hitter that young it's pretty impressive he also had a 34 percent strikeout rate which is basically what the highest strikeout rate in the majors is right now for any player is 34 percent so that's a little concerning with a 145 average so we'll see if he can improve that just, again, being 18 years old. And, and Fabian was really good after the draft. Salser and Scott were not great. Tanner Scott was much better than Cole Salser for the Marlins. They both had injury issues in 2022 in Miami. Salser basically became nothing for them. They released him. I believe he signed a, a minor league deal elsewhere this offseason. Salser not even in Miami anymore. Tanner Scott figures to be a solid part of the Marlins bullpen in 2023. But uh, that trade... So far, the best player coming out of it for either side could be Judd Fabian, and the Orioles hope that is the case, and that's why it's up here at number seven. Then number six on the list, December 2nd of 2020, the Orioles trade Jose Iglesias 
to the Los Angeles Angels for two right-handed pitching prospects in Garrett Stallings and Gene Pinto. Iglesias is still bouncing around in the big leagues. He's actually currently a free agent still at the moment, but is trying to get uh, another job. I could see him signing with the Dodgers potentially after they lost Gavin Lux for the season, but you've had two pitchers come over who've had interesting times with the Orioles. Garrett Stallings had a 6.28 ERA in double a last season, but he also had like one of the worst months ever. I believe it was July and was kind of solid outside of that. Then you have Gene Pinto who did have a 3.83 ERA in Aberdeen last year. The strikeouts went up, but the walks also went up after he had that great year in Delmarva in 2021. We should see Pinto in double A buoy this year. So we'll really get a look at what he can be. But I do think between Stallings and Pinto, I think one of these guys could get to the big leagues with the Orioles, which makes this trade at least somewhat worth it for a uh, Jose Iglesias, who obviously wasn't going to be any kind of shortstop of the future. But we will get to the top five coming up next. These are the best five trades that Mike Elias has made as Orioles GM. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. You just go to LinkedIn Jobs, you post your job, and then, you know, people like me at times, people like you listening, you can explore LinkedIn and you find the job so easily. It just, it, just, it makes it easy. The job process, LinkedIn makes it easier. And you can add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. And there's simple tools like screening questions that make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience. It's why small businesses rank LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So it's time to finish off this list of the top trades that Mike Elias has made as Orioles GM. We just counted down from number 17 to number six, and now we go into the top five. And number five on this list is a trade from this year's deadline. It is the Jorge Lopez deal. On August 2nd of 2022, the Orioles sent their closer, Jorge Lopez, over to the Minnesota Twins in exchange for four pitching prospects. Cade Povich, Yenier Cano, Juan Rojas, and Juan Nunez. Now, Lopez was not good down the stretch for Minnesota. They acquired him to be their closer. He ended up being like a mop-up fifth and sixth inning guy by the end of the year and was not pitching well. It was a bad experience for the Twins. It was bad for Lopez. I am 100% certain he would have been better than that had he stayed in Baltimore. Would he have been as good as the first half? Maybe not, but he wouldn't have been that bad. And he still had two and a half years of control left to be a good reliever, which helps your team. However, it does seem like the Orioles at least did get a solid return in this deal. Yenier Cano pitched a couple of times in the big leagues for the Orioles, was a little erratic, but has really, really good stuff. Solid sinker, change-up combination, throwing 97-98. Cade Povich was up and down. He did have a 6.94 ERA in 28, uh, 23 innings in Bowie, but a 25% strikeout rate to an 11% walk rate looks good. And then ESPN came out and ranked him as a top 100 prospect this offseason. So the left-hander in Povich, definitely uh, some helium this offseason. And then you had Rojas and Nunez, the two young guys. Rojas, the 19-year-old, did not allow a run in the FCL with the Orioles after the trade in nine innings. He also had 38 strikeouts to just four walks in the FCL with the Twins before the trade. And then Nunez was interesting. He's 22 years old, so the Orioles sent him to Delmarva after the trade. He had a 1.23 ERA in four starts, which seems good. But in 14 and two-thirds innings, he walked 13 batters and struck out just seven and somehow was lucky enough to have an ERA under two. So we'll see how that impacts him as he moves forward. But, you know, this trade, they, they got quantity and they may have gotten quality. And it seems like if they felt they had to trade Jorge Lopez, they did get at least a solid return, it looks like now. Trade number four on this list is the first trade where the Orioles did send a minor leaguer for a major leaguer, and it was the James McCann trade. On December 21st of 2022, the Orioles acquired catcher James McCann from the New York Mets for a player to be named later. That player ended up being teenage outfitter Luis De La Cruz, who has had some 
really bad stats in the Dominican Summer League and the FCL for the Orioles, basically a nothing prospect in exchange for a really, really solid backup catcher for Adley Rutschman, something the Orioles needed and did not have in 2022 because Robinson Chirinos did not fill that role well. And you're saying, hey, Connor, this is a really minor trade. Why is it number four? Well, again, it was the first one where the Orioles sent a minor league player for a major league player, and it helped their big league team. That's why it's at number four. Number three is going to be the Michael Givens trade. August 30th of 2020, the Orioles send Michael Givens to the Colorado Rockies in exchange for three prospects, Tyler Nevin, Taryn Vavra, and Michelle Deson. Now, in this trade, we know how it worked out. Givens was okay for Colorado, but they traded him quickly. He went to the Reds, then he pitched for the Mets, and now he's back with the Orioles, signing a one-year $5 million deal with Baltimore this offseason. Now, Tyler Nevin did have big league time in 21 and 22, just didn't work out. Orioles DFA'd him this offseason. Michelle Deson is still 20 years old, but really had a tough year in Delmarva last year. Just a 77 WRC plus and over 300 plate appearances. He hits the ball hard, but apparently the issue is he just beats the ball into the ground, refuses to hit the ball in the air at all. And that really makes you know his numbers tough and, and limits what they can be. So hopefully the O's can fix that again. He is still 20. And then as we know, Taryn Vavra got to the big leagues last year with the Orioles and impacted them in some type of way. He's had a great spring training. Now, Vavra did come down with a little bit of a shoulder injury this weekend, held him out of the lineup on Saturday, but it looks like he will be fine. And he's got an inside track, it seems, to make the Orioles opening day roster and be an impact bat off the bench. And the fact that they got Michael Givens back as well makes this a pretty good trade for Mike Elias. Trade number two on this list is the Dylan Bundy deal, December 4th of 2019. Really, you could argue the first big trade that Mike Elias made as Orioles GM. He sends Dylan Bundy to the Los Angeles Angels in exchange for four pitching prospects, Kyle Bradish, Zach Peake, Kyle Brinovich, and Isaac Matson. four right-handers coming to Baltimore in the deal. Now, Bundy was really good initially after the trade, had an amazing 2020 shortened season with the Angels, but since then has been a disaster. He was awful for the Twins this year. He is still a free agent at this point. And on the flip side, the Orioles got some good stuff back. Now, Isaac Matson was the first one to get to the big leagues as a reliever. He has since been released, is no longer with the organization. But the other three are now Zach Peake and Kyle Brunovich were having some really good numbers in the minors. Then both got Tommy John surgery last year. Kyle Brunovich should be back kind of May or June of this year. Peak may miss most of 2023, but could come back in the second half of the season from that TJ surgery and the Orioles still holding out hope for both of those guys to get to the big leagues. And then, of course, there's Kyle Bradish, who got to the big leagues last year and showed he's got some great stuff, had a phenomenal finish to his season. And it seems like most of us agree he's at least penciled in to have an opening day starting rotation spot for the Orioles here in 2023 and hopefully be a big part of the Orioles rotation for years to come. Getting in for Dylan Bundy, who seemed to be on the downswing at the time of the trade and the last couple of years have proven that. Kyle Bradish, a guy who it's funny to say this now because of how high the upside was for Dylan Bundy before his injuries, but Bradish might be able to be better than Bundy ever was for the Orioles with how good Bradish is looking. But of course I put that trade number two because number one for me at this point, we don't even know how it's going to work out because it only happened about a month ago, but a trade that signals you're done fully rebuilding has to be number one for me. It is the Cole Irvin trade on January 26th of 2023. The Orioles sent Daryl Hernandez, one of their shortstop prospects, and a top 20 prospect in the system over to the Oakland Athletics. They got Cole Irvin in that deal, who's going to be in their major league starting rotation. Also got a minor league right-handed pitching prospect in Kyle Verbitsky back from Oakland in that deal as well. And we don't know how it's going to work out because none of these guys have played a game in an Orioles uniform, Irvin or Verbitsky yet. You know, we got to wait for this season. But what we do know is Cole Irvin's had two really solid big league seasons with the A's and has locked in a spot to the Orioles rotation. Is going to give them depth, going to give them innings and could give them some really good starts as well. Verbitsky was named the pitcher with the best command in the A system. We'll probably see him in double A buoy. He could potentially be a major league piece. And Daryl Hernandez has some high upside, but He's probably, what, the sixth or seventh best shortstop prospect in the Orioles system before the trade. So he's a guy who was expendable. And the Orioles finally, with all this prospect capital and having the number one system in baseball, as Baseball America named them for the first time the other day, finally started trading away from those top guys in the system to get big league talent. That's exactly what they did in this deal. Hopefully there's more better deals than this that are in this vein, but it's a great start moving that way. And that's why it is number one 
on the list. So there's my list from one through 17 from the best trades to the worst trades that Mike Elias has made as Orioles GM so far. Make sure to sound off in the YouTube comments here what you think I got wrong. What do you think is Mike Elias' best trade? What do you think is Mike Elias' worst trade? And let me know what I did right, what I did wrong when ranking this list of 17 trades. But that'll just about do it for today's episode, although we do have to reveal the winner of the Orioles Hawaiian shirt. And thank you to everyone who entered in, who subscribed to the Locked on Orioles podcast on YouTube. Please continue to do that and to put in the YouTube comments their favorite spring training memory or favorite thing about Orioles spring training. I got a lot of responses here. Let me pull up the number of of how many. I got 127 responses of people entering into this contest, put them into a random generator, and I came out with the response from Wayne Strauss. Congratulations, Wayne Strauss. You are the winner of the Orioles Hawaiian shirt. Again, there it is, the never-before-worn Orioles Hawaiian shirt. I still haven't looked this up. This is either the 2019 or the 2021 version. I think it might be the 2021 version, but there you go. The Orioles Hawaiian shirt, Wayne, is yours. Wayne put his answer for spring training, said, Spring training is always exciting because hope springs eternal. This year, even more for this longtime Orioles fan because of all the great young talent. Well, congratulations, Wayne. You have won the Orioles Hawaiian shirt. So, Wayne, make sure to send an email to LockedOnOrioles at gmail.com. Again, that is LockedOnOrioles at gmail.com to claim your prize. And I'll give you more information about how to get your Hawaiian shirt once you send that email. But don't worry. We'll be doing plenty more giveaways throughout the season here on the podcast. And to make sure you're always going to be entered to those giveaways, you have to be subscribed to the Locked On Orioles podcast on YouTube. So if you haven't done it already, go do it right now. Hit that subscribe button on the Locked On Orioles YouTube page, and you'll have that first step to be entered into any Orioles giveaways we do throughout the season. But that'll do it for today's episode. I'll be back tomorrow. We can all watch a spring training game today. So enjoy that. This afternoon, Masson is airing its first of four spring training games, which is the lowest total of any team in baseball. But their first of four spring training games is being aired this afternoon here on Monday, which means when I'm back on the Tuesday episode, I'll break down everything I saw. Cole Irvin gets the start. We'll talk about how he looked, the pitchers behind him, the hitters, the general vibes from spring training, everything. We'll break it all down coming up on tomorrow's episode. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb. And this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.